So one question pops into my head, and I'm sure it's in a lot of listeners' uh, minds when they hear this, but what the heck happened if you only had one goalie and no backup if he got hurt? It was interesting. The, the home team was supposed to provide an extra goaltender, and you can imagine what the quality of that goaltender was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, the one we supplied was he, he, he was a goaltender and he played at uh, McGill <laughs> but I don't think he played an NHL game and uh, that was typical occasionally and not that rare the trainer was an old goaltender on the teams quite a few of the teams the, the uh, person that acted as the trainer uh, equipment manager and all that. One of those two people was usually an old goaltender, and that's the one they'd probably choose to uh, put in the net if somebody got hurt. But, yeah, no, there was not, not a whole lot of reserve backup there. It was just make do. And Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 139, part two of the Perry Harper Hockey Journey, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Petlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Today, we're entering the octagon with Mr. Terry Harper, and we'll begin round two of his hockey journey as we now transition to his life as a professional hockey player back when there were only six teams in the NHL. But before we do, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. I have to apologize for the abrupt ending of part one of Mr. Harper's hockey journey. It's like when you're a fan of the home team that's down by three at the end of the second, battle back to tie the game in dramatic fashion, sending the contest into overtime, only to lose the game in the first 30 seconds of that final frame. Wah, wah, wah. Well, that's how I felt. We were settled in, ready for the next chapter of Terry's story, getting to the really good stuff, and then it's over. Well, today we're going to fix that. Terry Harper is an incredible story. Born in 1940, his childhood wasn't an easy one as he was raised during the war and experienced all the hardships that came along with this worldwide challenge. He also at a young age came close to losing his life from the complications of a fire he was involved in, resulting in years of skin grafting, not knowing if he'd survive the event or be able to walk or do sports ever again. But as we'll see throughout his 18-year tenure in the NHL, Terry exemplified the epitome of defensive prowess. A cornerstone of the Montreal Canadiens dynasty from 1963 through 1972, he played an integral role in securing an impressive five Stanley Cup victories for the historic franchise. So ladies and gentlemen, get your end dialed in as we begin part two of this captivating tale of Terry Harper, a beacon of inspiration whose resilience, dedication, and unwavering spirit continue to resonate with hockey enthusiasts around the world. Terry, welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Thank you, Lance. It's a very pleasure to be back with you. I enjoyed the conversation last time, and well, this time even more so, I believe. Well, I hope so, and I have to apologize for the technical difficulties I had with part one of your story. Um, today, I, I, I did something different. I said a little prayer to the podcast gods, uh, asking for a smooth show. It still didn't start out well, but we're uh, beginning here, so hopefully we'll be all set for this episode. But 
thanks again for taking time out of your day and for being so accommodated. Accommodating, I appreciate it. Um, last episode, we weaved in and out of your childhood, growing up during the war, tough times, had to overcome some early adversity, being involved in a childhood fire. You battled back, earned a college scholarship at the University of Michigan, but the Montreal Canadiens squealed on you, apparently, uh, saying you got paid playing for the Regina Pats. You decided to make it official and turn pro. You were just about to start talking uh, about your road to your first NHL game as we were wrapping up uh, talking about the most influential coach you ever had, and that was Toe Blake. So I guess a good starting point would be uh, when you left Regina and moved to the EPHL and the Montreal Royals and uh, Hull, Ottawa Canadiens. How about start there and work your way towards uh, the day you played your first game in the NHL? Take it away, Terry. Well, my first game I played that I remember real well was against Detroit Red Wings, and uh, I remember uh, falling down, uh, skating backwards with, when Howe was coming down on me and just falling down. And with not, no, nothing he did, he just, yeah, I think nerves must have got me. But uh, I recovered after that, and the game went pretty well for me. But uh, it was a horrible start. <laughs> <laughs> so when you left... Regina, uh, you know, you were basically going across the country. Uh, was that a tough transition for you, kind of being away from uh, your family and friends? Because they, they were pretty close to you still then, weren't they? Yeah, they were. I, no, it wasn't tough at all because you're living the dream at that point. You're getting a chance to uh, play in the NHL, and uh, it seems like everything else becomes second. Uh, nature at that time to me anyway it did uh, yeah the, this is something you've been dreaming about from the time you first skated and now it's actually happening so it was kind of a happy moment to be leaving Regina and moving up and getting a chance to play in the NHL how long was there uh, in between when you left Regina you know, how, how long did you play in the minors uh, with the Royals or the uh, Hull of Ottawa Canadians before you ended up playing your your first NHL game? You know, what was it like playing that next level of hockey up? My first year was with the Montreal Royals, who were based in Montreal, and uh, I played for them. But I also had to attend all the Canadian games, especially the Saturday night games, with my bag packed, ready to join the team. Um on the because they always played away on Sunday at a, in one of the American cities. So the Saturday night after the game, we'd catch a the team would catch a train in West uh, Montreal, and we'd travel overnight in the train and then play. I never did get to go on any of the trips that year until the playoffs, and then I was in the playoff. I I was picked up full time and traveled with the Canadians. Uh, I guess by that time, the Royals, our season had ended or was close to it. But that was my thing was to be ready to join the club at any time. In those days, the team, they didn't carry at the most defense one they would have would be five. And the most forwards they'd have would be 11 and one goaltender. So there was no oh, really wow. extra players uh, if an injury or something happened. So that's why I did. That's why they had me in. Montreal, the Royals. Then the next season, uh, they sent me to Hull, Ottawa, and uh, was, that was Sam Pollock's operation, and that we won the uh, Eastern Professional League that year, the Cup. And then the next year, I started in Ottawa for a while, and then moved up to Montreal. Canadians, but I don't remember. Sometime during the season, I know we went back and forth. Uh, we had a house, I had a house in Ottawa, and uh, we had uh, three, four different guys would stay with us, uh, and uh, Caesar Maniego and uh, Red Berenson and myself in particular would never know who was going to be in Ottawa or who was going to be in Montreal. We were just going back and forth depending on what the Canadians were doing. Uh, we weren't getting to play with them. We were just there again as subs they wanted to make sure they had somebody ready if somebody got hurt and we won the eastern 
professional league uh, title that uh, first year there. And the next year I didn't finish there. I ended up in Montreal at the end. And we didn't win the cup that year. When did you become a, a full-time player then with them? And did, did you displace someone or was there an injury for you to get that opportunity? I, it, there probably was an injury. I just don't remember who it was uh, at the time. I, yeah, I don't really know. But, yeah, it was an injury because – Told Blake all like when he played four defensemen, there was no the fifth defenseman barely ever got on the ice. So yeah. And somebody got hurt, that fifth defenseman was the one that was sitting there, and then the next one would be the one they brought in from Ottawa. And it was the same with the forwards. There was uh, you know, like I said eleven forwards, there was two extra with the team and uh, so that's the person that would get the chance to play if you were there sitting there on the bench game after game. So one question pops into my head, and I'm sure it's in a lot of listeners' uh, minds when they hear this, but what the heck happened if you only had one goalie and no backup if he got hurt? It was interesting. The, the home team was supposed to provide an extra goaltender. And you can imagine what the quality of that goaltender was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, the one we supplied was he, he, he was a goaltender and he played at uh, McGill. <laughs> but I don't think he played an NHL game. And uh, that was typical. Occasionally, uh, not that rare, the trainer was an old goaltender on the teams. Quite a few of the teams, the, the uh, person that acted as the trainers, uh, equipment manager and all that, one of those two people was usually an old goaltender, and that's the one they'd probably choose to uh, put in the net if somebody got hurt. <laughs> but, yeah, no, there was not, not a whole lot of reserve backup there. It was just make do. And, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So, yeah. um you, you finally kind of establish yourself as a everyday player in the NHL. What, how did your life change from being a minor leaguer to now being an NHL player? You know, from was, was there, you know, if you look at today, you, you're playing in the minors, you know, you're staying at the Motel 6, you know, you're in the NHL, you're staying at the Ritz-Carlton. Mm-hmm. How did your life improve making the jump up there? Pretty much similar to the, uh, in retrospect, uh, we traveled by bus in the minors, stayed in the motels, and in the NHL we traveled by train and stayed in the nice hotels uh, in the center of the cities, the old classic hotels like the Roosevelt in New York and I forgot the one in Chicago and Detroit, but they were you know, the fancy hotels where we stayed. Did you end up buying a car finally then? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Once Stop I, lying on... once I got Go to NHL, I could afford a few things. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking about that, you know, what, what was the difference in pay, if you don't mind? I mean, be, again, there's, if you're, if you got an AHL salary today, I mean, it's it's significant, the difference in pay. How much of a difference was it for you when you played in the NHL compared to in the minors? Oh, yeah. Well, when I signed with the Montreal Canadiens, Frank Selke was the GM, and it was after that year that I played the uh, partial year there. He, ca- he called me in, and uh, two things happened. <laughs> One, he said, we are Montreal Canadiens. We're the elite team in the league and the min, the minimum salary in the league is 7000 and because of that we give the players 7500 because uh, we're the elite team in the league okay. <laughs> and, and the minors we made about 3500 so it was you know that's double kind of thing so there was quite yeah. a bit of difference and not, not neither of them sound very high by today's standards I know but uh, and then the other thing that he did, this is the crazy part, he, he called me in before I went home for the summer, and he said, oh, you're, 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 you're always in a 
fighting, not fighting all the time, but standing up for the play, other players on the team and getting mixed up in the scrums and things. And he said, uh, maybe you should, I'll give you $500 and you can uh, go take fighting lessons, boxing lessons this summer. And uh, so I <laughs> got this like your 500 And then I went off to Vancouver to summer school and summer school was over the middle of August, and training camp wasn't until the middle of September. So I had a uh, better part of a couple of weeks at least before I had to leave to head back to Montreal. And, and I'd always want to have flying lessons. So I went out to the airport and uh, spent the $500 to get uh, my pilot's license. And I was scared I was going to get asked to it <laughs> for the rest of my life. But <laughs> oh, That's brilliant. Yeah. But that's you. You are you are uncommon. I mean, you're going to college, uh, taking college courses when no one else was, and and now you're. I want to fly, but I play in the NHL. I don't care. I'm flying. They told me to do boxing lessons. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, I, I I think that your your story is amazing. So, did you end up taking any boxing lessons? No, I never did. No, I took my beatings. <laughs> I never did, I never did box, but I sure threw a lot. But I got to fly really a lot and, and, and uh, bought an airplane, and the family used it all summer. We'd go all over the North America uh, at different times to go skiing, oh, wow. visiting. And, yeah, that was our families lived on uh, farms out in Saskatchewan, so we'd go out there and just land on the fields and visit them on the way to Vancouver every summer. That kind of how oh, wow. structured our summer was the trip out there was to visit. And we had the flexibility with the airplane to go right to where they lived and not have to have a car or anything. Yeah, so it was something that the whole family really enjoyed, and it was good for us, I think. What, what, uh, what did a, a schedule like the Canadians, the NHL schedule look like back then? Only having when you started six teams, how many games were they playing for total for the season? Well, there was seventy-two games, and we played each team fourteen times, seven at home and seven away. And I don't think anybody in the league didn't know every other player's every move, every even what they were thinking. I think you knew, <laughs> you knew them so well quite different today when you don't see a team for a long time. And, and now I know they use videos and stuff to help you. Uh, this is pre any videos and, but we knew the other players so well. Is there, you know, you look at the game today and fighting's kind of been phased out and that you said you took your lumps and stuff, but how do you think, you know, back, 10, 15, 20 years when fighting was, you know, still pretty prominent where you had the designated tough guy. How do you think you would fare with one of those guys? I have, I'd get beat up badly, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they weren't in the league when I played, actually. that's That came up, you know, very prevalent in the 90s, I think, when they had the tough guys on the team, the fighters, and... I've read a couple of books where they yeah. talk. These guys would, before the game started, they'd sound off to each other about uh, taking each other on or something in the game. Uh, that didn't go on when I played. We Sure, we had some tough guys. Probably the best fighter I ever saw was John Ferguson, who played with us. But uh, he wouldn't go up to the tough guy on the other team before the game and say, uh, we're getting into it tonight, sort of thing like I read in these uh, biographies. So it, the fighting happened because of something on the ice, you know, something accidentally got hit in the head with the, somebody's stick or something, and then they went after each other. But it wasn't, to, I don't think it was as programmed as it seemed to me when reading about the history in the 90, late 80s and 90s. And I think it's gone away again now. I don't think their teams have got just a, a fighter anymore. I think there's a, you've got more, they're more looking for an all-round player. Right, right. So I look at, um, you know, back when you were playing, I, I mean, you, you still didn't have to wear a helmet, and there was a lot more stick work, clutch and grab and slashing. I mean, it was like prison rules. Um, 
how <laughs> I just I just look at how the game has changed, you know, and you're saying that you'd get pummeled. I mean, but it it, it was a it was a brutal game back then is because I mean guys chopping each other, cross checking each other in the face, and you didn't wear helmets. Yeah, no helmets and no masks on the goaltenders. <laughs> no, no, it was yeah. a real tough game. If you touched the puck, you were going to get hit. That every time you touched the puck, you were going to get hit, or you were going to hit somebody that touched the puck. Uh, uh, it wasn't till, until expansion in the late '60s when they expanded the team and diluted all the teams a little that you began to become more open uh, style of play. Um, like it would have been a lot tougher for Gretzky to set all the records he did in the era when I started than it would have uh, that it was when he did when he right. didn't really have that that closer checking teams. That's right. So let's get to this story, my friend. We teased him in the uh, part one, but uh, for everyone that didn't hear it, uh, at at some point. In the NHL, back when uh, Mr. Harper was breaking into the league, there was only one penalty box. So when there was a penalty call, both players would go into the one box. And I can't believe that that lasted. But uh, apparently, uh, 10 days after his last time in the penalty box, they changed the rule where now it is like it is today, where each team has their, their own penalty box and there's a separation because... Of what happened, Terry? What did you do? You know, I I can't really recall what happened other than the two of us were put in the penalty box and the fight broke out again. And why, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> it's pretty common. Uh, like you said, there was one penalty box, and if there had been a scrum on the, out on the ice, they might have four players from each team in there sitting in there with one old uh, fella, an old, uh, a retired person usually was the gatekeeper. And you'd have all these players. There weren't even enough places to sit down. They'd all be standing in there. So I wonder that it, it went on as long as it did until uh, so yeah. Pope had that fight in Toronto, which went on and on, and the crowd was reaching over and swinging at us. And, yeah, <laughs> and the whole thing became very ironic to me. Because a few years later, after he retired, he got named coach of uh, Los Angeles Kings. And it's when the uh, World Hockey League was starting. And I kind of declared myself as a free agent. I was going to go out and negotiate, uh, as were a lot of the players in the NHL at that time uh, going to, were doing that to go with the World Hockey League. And... I had done, was told the Canadians I was leaving and I was going to go to Quebec City with J.C. Trombley and John Ferguson and I because we could live in Montreal and we we're going to get an apartment in Quebec and play for Quebec in the World Hockey League, just go down and play games and stuff. Sam Pollock heard that. He called me in and he says, well, if we can get you the same money in the NHL, will you stay in the NHL? And, of course, uh, you know, right away, the reason he's doing that is he wanted to see if he could make a trade and get something in return for losing, you know, you're going to lose three players and not get anything. And here's he got a chance to get a trade. So uh, I said, yeah, you guys, you've been, he actually ran the teams in Ottawa when I was there. So he'd been very fair with me. And I said, of course I will. So he, he called me in and he said, oh, I want you to go talk to LA. And I said to him, um, I said an NHL team, Sam. <laughs> but <laughs> because I told you, I'll talk to him. I'll go out there. And I, I wanted the trip more than anything, I think, as uh, Ralph Backstrom and Rogi Vashon were both there, who I'd played with in Montreal for, well, especially Ralph a long time and, and Rogi a couple of years. So I went out there and they said, uh, introduced me to the coach. and here it was Bob Popert, and I kind of I knew, but I didn't know the sort of thing. And so I spent a day, two days with him, just talking hockey and the, reminiscing about how you play the game and how we 
competed and all that. And I liked the guy so much, I went back and I told Sam, I said, I'm going to L.A. Never mind. The, he had a, in the meantime, he'd arranged for me to go to Boston. I said, no, I'm not interested in going to Boston anymore. I'm going to go to L.A. Yeah, so that's how I ended up uh, cool. playing for Pulper that, after the, the uh, our history of that big fight in, in Montreal, in Toronto, I mean, when we divided the boxes. Uh, the last thing I would have thought I was going to go to L.A. And when I met him, I liked him. He was he was like Toe Blake in a lot of ways. Uh, he believed in making a team, not just having uh, uh, players and uh, creating a team. It didn't matter if you had the best player at every position. As long as you had a team, you got a good chance of winning. And he, he was a real advocate of that. And I love that feeling that you... You're going to make sure you're as strong defensively as you are offensively. And, yeah, I knew it was a winning combination. So I, that's why I decided to go to L.A. Uh, and I played there three years. Uh, and uh, then they traded me to Detroit. Uh, uh, kind of totally unannounced, unexpected, because I just had signed a new contract for five years with L.A. And they traded me immediately for Dion and... Uh, I was really upset, so I uh, decided I was going to uh, fight the NHL again and, uh, and become a free agent and go to the World Hockey again. But uh, it never did happen. I, I um, decided with, on the advice from a lawyer in LA, LA when we were in court, and uh, he and I were sitting there, and the NHL, of course, had 12 lawyers, one for each team or <laughs> at the time, and uh, all dressed in their suits and heavy, you know, heavy expenses account. And I had this one little local fellow, and the judge said to me, uh, you know, I, I, you'll, I really like your case, but if you want to play hockey this next winter, you probably should go to Detroit and negotiate the best deal you can. And I took that advice, and I went there, and I had a good time in Detroit, but it was a long way up because they were really at the bottom when I went there, and we did manage to improve quite a bit, but uh, not to win any championships or any league titles or anything. You kind of went through everything quick, and we haven't even talked about your first Stanley Cup, so uh, talk a little bit about building up to the playoffs. Uh, did you feel like you had a team that maybe could make a run for it? Uh, and, and first, what what year was it with you or when you were with Montreal? Did you win? 62. Uh, your first one? And then you could... Yeah, 1962. Yeah, the, the, even the very first year I got to play with them, um, well, the first year at the, uh, that I was there in 61, um, so it was probably 63, I guess, in that, but 61, the, I was with the team, like I had mentioned all year, as a sub, not ever dressing. but And then when the playoffs came, the Montreal Royals were not in. Well, I don't know if we were in the playoffs or we got beat out early. Then I was full-time with the Canadians practicing and traveling. I, although, again, I never got on the ice. I did, but uh, did there was a, they had an extra forward and a defenseman, myself. And uh, they, they lost to Chicago that year. But I never did get to play until the next year. And I don't really remember what, who we played the first year we won the Cup when I was there. Um, all that was kind of passed me by now. I just don't remember. But I remember the excitement of when yeah. you win. And, uh, and some of the years we fell behind and you know, and fought our way back and yeah just a lot of good things that happened over the years in the playoffs so you win five you know the first one's not going to be maybe as memorable did did uh did you did you have a a a major role in that first cup where you were playing or you were more in and out of the lineup or out of the lineup no i was fully in the lineup played every shift uh right from the time i started playing uh, I became one of the four defensemen, and, it, and Toe Blake only played the four. We had defensemen that they had. Yeah. The fifth defenseman never got on the ice in the whole cup series sometimes. Uh, it was just the four of us would be out time after time, yeah. Uh, I played a lot of years with uh, 
Jacques Laperriere and Ted Harris, and the other right defenseman was J.C. Trombley. He, he was the other right, and you know he was a very offensive-minded uh, uh, player. So he he was always on the power plays, and I was the defensive-minded one player. So I was always the penalty killer, on the right side. And uh, over the years, my first uh, partner was uh, uh, John G. Talbot. And then uh, after that, LaPerriere, who I'd played with, uh, we'd played together in Ottawa. So I knew him really well, and we played well together. Did, uh, I know you won five cups. Is there, is there one that sticks out more than any of the others? Not to me now, no. Even like winning the first one, which had to be an exciting time, doesn't really stand out any more than any of the others. You see when they win the cup nowadays that, you know, they, they have the big ticker tape parades and everything. What was the celebration like in Montreal when you guys would win a cup? We'd have, we'd have a parade through town with the with us in the convertibles and the cup in one of the convertibles and and everybody in the, down uh, St. Catherine Street would be just out and that would end up down at the uh, city hall and the mayor would you know I don't know talk give a little speech and yeah it was a big celebration for the city. All right, uh, I want to read something to you you might have seen it and i gotta lean forward so i'm sorry if my voice gets a little different because i'm away from the mic but it's in small print but this is a uh apparently a letter uh it's on maple leaf gardens uh stationery dated october 2nd 1962 it's uh a letter to the players welcoming them to training camp just want to read a little bit about it so it said uh, it starts, we'll start on September 7th. Uh, you go to the hotel, physical examinations will be at 9 a.m. Um, after dinner, players will report to the trainers, uh, pick up their gear. Golf will be a must in the training camp schedule. Be sure to bring along your golf equipment. Uh, <laughs> arrangements have been completed uh, to use whatever golf club. Uh, I expect you to report in good condition are not more than seven pounds over your playing weight with a minimum uh, of being able to do 20 push-ups, 20 sit-ups, and 30 knee bends. Boy, they were really good pushing you guys back then. <laughs> Pretty soft. <laughs> my, my, my has the, the game changed the training camps now, huh? So that was a true letter. So uh, <laughs> what? Do you remember some days in training camp? I mean, what was it training camp or more of a country club kind of thing? No, it was a real tough training camp. It was two a day practices, and and it needed it because a lot of the players in those wouldn't have done anything from the time the season ended till it began again. Probably put on twenty five pounds, maybe. There's quite often the twenty five thirty pounds some of them had put on. So the training camp was really tough. At least two a day. Uh, practices, long practices. There was no off ice training in those days. It was all just on the ice. And then it would go on for a month, the training camp. And we w Montreal had a policy where they never played another NHL team in training camp. They just played minor, the minor league teams, mostly Montreal's or sometimes some of the other minor league teams. But uh, I don't know what the reasoning for that was, but it, that's the way it was with Montreal, where the other teams, uh, most of the other teams, would play maybe one or two games against each other or somebody else in, in the league. Um, but uh, we never did. We just played the, like our farm teams and other team, other NHL team farm teams for our training camp. But it went on for a month, and it was pretty intense. You, you stay, did stay in a hotel uh, all together, and the meals were there and uh, served. So, my, you know, back then, there, there wasn't the NHL PA. Uh, you know, did you know? I look at myself and my career. I was just happy to be there. They could have gave me any, offered me anything. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
uh, you know, did they kind of have a stranglehold on you? Did you guys know that, you know, maybe you were being taken advantage of, you know, in your later years? And were you part of uh, when they made the shift to where it is today? You know, we definitely knew that from the time I first put my skates on in Regina, Saskatchewan, I belonged to Montreal Canadiens. So consequently, from that day on, if I went through to junior, uh, you know, through the minor league, the junior team, then the minor pro, and the NHL, uh, nobody else, uh, the other teams, could negotiate with you without making a deal with Montreal. So they owned us, and that was pretty typical of all the players because the the six teams in the league had divided up the country, and that's where you know we heard that Quebec had first rights and everybody in Quebec, but. Ontario was, you know, divided up where it was, I think St. Catharines was uh, Chicago, and I forgot where all the different teams were, but they were all owned by, uh, the, the rights to all the players was owned by the NHL teams. And it was the same out west, and Regina was the, owned the rights to all the players that ever skated there was to Montreal because they had sponsored the the, the uh, junior league team there. Um, that, that's, that's the way the, system, the whole system, then you had no uh, real uh, chance to negotiate anything until, like I said, when the first time I got to do it was when the World Hockey League started. And, uh, you know, we had yeah. guys like Bobby Hall signing for big money, which really helped, uh, gave us a chance to uh, all benefit from it. So I got a bunch of random questions here for you uh, as we move towards the second half here. Uh, what's the Harper hat trick? I think you can get through a game without a, scoring a goal. <laughs> no, I the, used to say, what, I don't know, it's a couple of assists and a couple of penalties. I'm not quite sure what that was, but yeah. You wore number 19. Uh, does that number signify anything? No, it was available when I was there. They, we didn't. Re, I didn't have any questions asked of me if I wanted it or not. They just assigned it to us, and uh, you're so happy to get a number in the player uniform that uh, you didn't ask for anything. You just said, oh, "I'm, uh, I'm ready." <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. The um, first, first few games I played, I actually I played I think with uh, number twenty six the first seasons some games uh but then when i became full-time i got 19. when you when you let's let's transition to to now you know the end of your career um how did that kind of happen did you go out on your terms and then what was the transition what did you get into you know after that once you retired from playing but my last year in detroit when I finished there, I was I stayed the next year there, um, and not I wasn't playing or going to play. I was just uh, my kids were still in high school, and because I'd moved them once in high school, uh, my wife and I said, "Well, we'll just stay in Detroit. It's probably not where we're going to live because we had a house in California, but we'll stay here until they finish high school." And uh, so that has been our plan, and then. It was in the summertime that last that during that summertime, I got a phone call one Sunday morning. We were having breakfast, the oh, the whole family, and it was, it was the uh, general manager from Colorado Rockies calling, and he wanted called me and said, you know, we'd like to have you come and join us as an assistant coach, and uh, and I told him I said I'm not I'm I not interested because I told the kids I'll stay here in Detroit and I was helping another friend out and I was quite happy with that but uh, I went back to the breakfast table and they said who called you dad Sunday morning I said oh the GM and he wants me to go to Colorado and the kids go oh we want to go to Colorado dad and, and so, <laughs> Oh yeah, the two of them. Huh, we really want to go to Colorado. Well, see, as a family, we skied, and so they thought, "Oh, that's great." So yeah, so I called the guy back. I said, "I'll take that job." 
So that's how I got that's out awesome. to uh, Colorado. I, I, the first year I went there as an assistant coach. And about halfway through the year, we were having injury things, and I started to play again. I played again the rest of that season. <laughs> no uh, way. Like Rockies, but, <laughs> yeah. and, and then when I retired from the Rockies, finally finished, uh, uh, I uh, decided to, uh, well, I was going to get involved in real estate. So I moved to Colorado Springs, and I, we met a fellow from there, and he said, I'll teach you how to be a realtor and stuff. So I went there and I got started doing real estate there and thought I would stay there in Colorado. But uh, after a few years, we uh, ended up with this uh, deciding to get into, uh, actually going to be a, uh, into the restaurant business and ended up in Sacramento because of that. So now I got back to California, never did go back to Southern California because over the years, when we'd been away from it, we still had our house down there. Matter of fact, we had two houses most of the time. But uh, one of our kids was going to USC, the oldest boy. And uh, we, every time we went to his graduation and his master's graduation, and then when his PhD, we spent more and more time on the 408 freeway than we did do visiting or having fun. So. My wife said, well, we're not going back. So we decided not to go back. And so that's how we chose. And then we chose Northern California because some of our friends that we had met down there were from Northern California and were raving about how nice it was a place to live. And so I guess that's how what got us to uh, Sacramento area. So what did you do after you got real estate in that uh you know, did you, how long did you do that for? Did you do any youth hockey coaching? Very well. I didn't actually, when I was in Colorado Springs, I did do a couple of camps with the Canadian, with the U.S. national team, Olympic team. Uh, spent, you know, a 10 day camp or something there a couple of times. And when I came out to Colorado, I just threw all my equipment away. I never even moved it. I didn't have any skates or anything i thought i was finished with hockey and uh, satisfied with uh, what i'd done and, and and a couple of years out after i was out here another friend from regina uh, ernie hickey the uh, hickeys were there was bill and ernie hickey at both i'd lived at their house when i was in regina uh billeting uh, playing junior hockey and so he called me one day and he says, we're playing in this Snoopy tournament in Santa Rosa. Why don't you join us? And I said, oh, it sounds fun, but I, I don't have any equipment or anything. He says, oh, I'll round you up some stuff and you come. So I went to, over and played in this tur Snoopy tournament in Santa Rosa, and I had the best time of my life in hockey. I just really enjoyed the, the level of the old timers and, and reminiscing and talking hockey with the people. And consequently, from there, then I went and got equipment and got started playing again. And, you know, and I still play at least twice a week uh, today. Good for you. Good for you. Did you have any, um, any surgeries because of hockey, like while you were playing? Anything that kind of set you back? Or did you kind of come out of there pretty good? I've had I had a couple of injuries that were kind of bad. Three three really stick out in my mind, and one was an operation, and it wasn't where it hurt something, but I had I grew a cyst on my knee, and uh, they took it was uh, I couldn't sleep without bending my knee and and keeping my knee bent, so they removed the cyst, and the doctor messed up the operation, and I still have trouble with it all the time. And then another yeah. one, I broke my back, uh, not, and not in the way that I, I what it, it was a transverse process where one of those little ears that sticks off a vertebrae, the muscles tear it off, and uh, I had that. Uh, <laughs> that one I was in the hospital with. In a, <laughs> this great story, <laughs> I was in the hospital and they had me laying on a board, and I was getting sicker the second. Day. So I got up and snuck out of the hospital and was walking home when they caught me. <laughs> and 
And to, they then <laughs> brought me home. They put me in an ambulance and drove me home. But they and they didn't make me lay on that board anymore. So, uh, so I had the back injury and um, yeah, the shoulder separation or dislocation once, and right. uh, I think that's all. And none of which have needed operation other than the knee, which. Uh, because of all the results, I wish I'd have never had it operated on. But I, I guess it uh, probably the cyst wasn't going to go away by itself. It probably needed to be operated yeah. on. What inspires you today, dude? I mean, you seem that you're skating twice a week. Uh, I think you mentioned in the first episode you're reading biographies all the time. Uh, you know, what, what gets you up excited in the morning? Uh, oh, I, I'm light. The things I do, yeah, yeah no, I go to uh, uh, Pilates a couple of days a week, yoga three days a week, and Zumba three days a week, and I uh, uh, have a new girlfriend that does what I met doing this and have a lot of fun doing it. Well, you seem like you're uh, a happy dude. Oh, uh, I, I got to ask, gotta ask you, um, you know, kind of the last couple questions here do you do you like the state of the game currently is it trending in the right direction i think it is now again i didn't like it there for a while when we had the the designated uh, fighter sort of thing i thought it got a, was too wide open and too uh, and too rough in one way yeah? that the, was more about who won the battles uh, rather than the play. And I think now I like the way it's going. It's uh, like I'm watching the NHL playoffs right now, the cup finals, and it's really exciting. I think they play really good hockey. Yeah. Very skilled things that we couldn't even think of doing when I played. Yeah, it just seems like the lineups are much deeper now as far as the skill. You know, even a, a fourth line would be a, you know, a second line you know, 15 years ago, yes. it's gotten that deep. Yeah. yeah, I think the skill level is going is going up and still going up, yeah. Well, they train full-time all of year round, and uh, it's got to be a right. benefit. To, and got people like yourself coaching them, uh, and there's individual little skills. So I think it's really improving the quality of the game and uh, the players. I agree, um, and I'm... I'm grateful I get to hang out with them uh, and uh, show them what I know. So who are you picking for the cup? Oh, I have a tough that, time that, with this one. That's a really tough one. I like the game that uh, the Panthers play. I love watching McDavid and the uh, dry sauce. <laughs> They're real tough to pick one or the other right now. I, somebody said, you know, talking I, about the uh, – the uh, well, the Panthers are ahead two nothing in in uh, the games. That's good. And when I think they flash something on the screen the other day, when that happens, ninety percent of the time that team wins, and uh, that goes up two nothing. And I said, well, I remember one year we were down two nothing in Detroit. We won, lost the first two games there. We won the next four games and was finished in six. So you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you don't know. You don't uh, know what's going to happen. Been entertaining. Yeah. Have, did you uh, did you watch any of the uh, the PWHL this year? No, I did hockey? not really. No. Well, I'm telling you, you should because uh, it is great hockey. I mean, I the the last two games I I watched uh, for the finals. Uh, I. I have a connection, a couple girls that I've worked with um, around the Minnesota team, but mm. my wife wasn't a big fan of girls' hockey, especially the younger levels, just because it's slower than boys, which she's not used to. But she yeah. was a fan of that game. So if you uh, if you have a chance, uh, look at that next year because it's uh, it's great yeah. hockey. Oh, when I, whenever I watch the uh, women in the Olympics or in the international yeah. games, oh, I love their hockey game. Really enjoy watching it. Yes, uh, it's it's not much to do with intimidation. It's more to do with skills and team play. 
like really enjoy it. Yeah. yeah, so I'm sure I would have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Terry, I don't know, man. I uh, I'm so thankful that we got through this episode. It it just I honestly I I normally don't have uh, many problems, but for some reason um, the internet and technology doesn't work for you. But we got through it and we persevered. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your journey. I want to congratulate you on amaz- an amazing hockey life and just so appreciative that you were so gracious uh, to share it with all the listeners here and with me today. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for your patience with me too. My trouble with even operating the computer or the phone. I, I always have trouble and I still do, And but uh, thank you. It's been a, uh, it's been, I just, I love it doing this, Terry, because, you know, you just kind of get into the the deeper layers of the onion and uh, you had so many fantastic stories that I know everyone's going to love. So thanks again for being here. And if I'm out in California anytime soon, I'm going to look you up and I hope that you have a bottle of wine that we can crack open together and uh, listen to a few more stories. I'd sure love to have you here, and we'll always have a bottle of wine. I actually belong to the wine club here in Sacramento, and I've made wine. So, okay, I'll uh, I'll see you next week. <laughs> there you go. All right, thank you, Lance. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing part two of the Terry Harper Hockey Journey. Every time I had the opportunity to chat with him, I felt like family, and you tap into a positive energy and outlook on life that is contagious. What a cool human being. If you want to learn more about Mr. Harper, I've put a few links in the show notes for easy access. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. If you liked this episode, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.